So my review time with the Studio C was a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, the first one that I got was either a device that was just outright defective or more likely used or probably both. Um, it was a device that when it when the first one arrived, it had a Leica Mobile SIM installed in it. Leica Mobile is a MVNO, which is a mobile virtual network operator, and they are based out of the UK, but they work all over the world, apparently. Uh, that's what they advertise, at least. I don't know anything about them. Um, it, was a, it was not a good model to start out with, so this review is not based on that model. I sent that one back. I got another one. This one seems like it's actually new, and it's actually working the way we would hope a new phone would work. Uh, but the other one, the SD card slot didn't work. I had, I had just about to take apart in order to get my SD cards back out of it. And once I did, I wasn't any more comfortable than sticking it in about five millimeters or so um, on this one here. Back off of it, there is my SD card slot right there. Um, and that one connects just fine. It works as you would expect it to work. At first on that one, the screen seemed fine. Um, I didn't think it was quite as sharp as the iPhone 5S's, which is what I've been using since the 5S has, was released. Um, but it was a good. It was fine, but it had, seemed to have an odd refresh rate to it. It's almost like there was a barely visible flicker. Um, it, it wasn't something that was readily noticeable, but as if you like saw it out of the corner of your eye, your peripheral vision, then you would notice that flicker being there. It was just, it was a little distracting, a little bit of a strange thing to see. So after all those issues, I went and sent that one back and got this one. So with this one, uh, there were a lot of accessories in the box. Um, Despite its appearance, the battery cannot be removed. It advertises a 3,000 milliamp battery. Uh, everything on it says that. It is a big battery that's in the back of it, um, but it is not removable. So don't go into this hoping that you're going to be able to easily replace the battery. Uh, for both the first phone and this one that I got, the battery was not charged at all in either case. So I had to plug them both up for about 20 minutes in order to get them working. Um, on the new phone, the SD card slot worked fine. Uh, it easily connects to Wi-Fi. Uh, there was no Android update that was needed right away. There was no major security update or anything like that for Android 5. Um, but it did need a 192 megabyte update for the carrier, which for somebody who's coming from an iPhone and where carrier updates take all of 12 seconds, it, that was horribly shocking to me. Um, and it, after the actual download occurred, it took about nine more minutes for the install to apply. And then on, it had to reboot as a result of that. And the reboot took about 10 minutes just by itself. It just sat at the blue screen where it says blue, bold like us. And I was contemplating powering it off, but I just decided to let it run. And after about 10 minutes, it powered back on for me. Um, my personal point of view is that obviously Android is not very well optimized for this chipset. Uh, I don't know if Android 5 is what this phone originally shipped with, but it, it definitely needs some TLC in my opinion, which we're probably not going to get a year and a half after the fact. On the replacement phone, the screen is good quality, not quite as sharp as the iPhone 5S, I don't think. Uh, the colors seem a little bit oversaturated but it is not unpleasant by any stretch. It is a very good screen. Uh, definitely happy to have been using it and looking at it for this past week. The adaptive screen brightness on it works well, but seems to overcompensate in both directions. Uh, there are times where if it does not see any ambient light source, it will just go almost all the way off. And if you're in a room that's got some bright overhead lights, uh, it will crank up a hundred percent and it's it's almost blinding if it could you know go to about 75 percent brightness it would be much easier uh, i think on the eyes when using it in a well-lit room like this one um the wi-fi is solid on it it performs reasonably well there's no major slowdowns with it uh there's no five gigahertz radio i could not get the chromecast feature to work properly so i could not cast this over to a chromecast that i have um, and I can't get Google Music to work, Google Play Music to work at all to save my life. Uh, it, I'm not an idiot. I do a lot of IT work. Uh, I, I work with mobile devices. I work for Apple and a lot of large profile corporations that sell cell phones and use 
and kind of a bring your own device mentality when working inside of them. So I've worked with iPhones and Android devices and even Windows phones over the years. I don't think this is really a problem with Android. However, this seems more like an issue with Google services. I could not for the life of me get the Music Manager app to recognize that I was logged in on my Mac, which of course means that nothing gets pushed to the phone. So Google Play Music didn't work for me. Uh, the good thing about Android though is that you have options and I recalled my 2009 days when I was using an HTC Hero and I went to download and install Double Twist which has changed a lot in the last seven years. Um, but it more or less got me up and running and I got my music on my phone, um, got my audiobooks on my phone. It didn't want to sync my podcast correctly, so I, I used an app called Pocket Cast. Um, so I had to buy that off of the App Store, which that downloads podcasts directly to the phone, which is fine and dandy. The only problem with it is that I, the Pocket Cast app would never sync right for me. I would go from, I might be at a point where, say, I'm 30 minutes into a podcast, get to work, turn off the app, or not even turn off the app, not like close it, but just put the phone to sleep, go about my normal work day, and when I leave for work, uh, get back in my car, hook it up to the Bluetooth, which it connects to the Bluetooth in my car, just like that, no problems at all whatsoever. Um, and when it connected to the Bluetooth, it would, for some reason, sync me back 20 minutes, and it does that with every podcast, it seems, no matter whether I'm on Wi-Fi or using the cellular service. So it, it's one of these things where podcasting is not perfect on iOS. If you're just a consumer and you're not a podcast maker, uh, I know if you're a podcast maker, it's nowhere near perfect. Um, but it is woefully better than this Pocket Cast app, which unfortunately is what I had to go down and suffer through for this past week. Uh, podcast is a, Pocket Cast is not horrible, it's just not what I would like. I don't want to manually retract where I was in a podcast and then try to find that location and then come back to it. I would rather just know where I was. I'd rather not sync to anything. I'd rather just save where I was. I'm not syncing it to the cloud. I'm not listening to it in multiple places. If I was, I could understand it wanting to send update and pull down data, but that's just not happening. So uh, anyway, podcasts, pocket casts was a, a real frustration for me on the podcast front. Sometimes uh, when rebooting the phone, um, the Studio C will not populate names to the phone numbers. So for example, the phone would reboot. If I had any text messages that I were I received while the phone was off, it will, of course, notify you that you received text messages, but it doesn't populate any of the names. It just gives you the phone numbers. And two or three minutes later, then the phone numbers pop back in. Um, I, I don't have my phone number saved on my SIM card, which is, God, it's almost barbaric at this point to do that. Um, they're all synced with Google, so I'm using Google services. I would hope that they would just come back in automatically, but that doesn't seem to be the case for this particular phone. Uh, I am also not syncing with any third-party services like Facebook or Twitter, Yahoo, anything like that. So let's talk about some good things with the Studio C. Uh, one thing is great is the uh, the cameras are pretty daggum good on this phone. Uh, the rear cameras and the front cameras both perform well. There is something on the selfie cam called beauty mode, which makes me look like I'm wearing makeup. I've never worn makeup in my life, so this is odd for me. The HDR mode is pretty good in my opinion, nothing incredible. Low light mode seems to work reasonably well. These are some pictures I took at a spa that I visited. I also took a selfie uh, just to test out the low light mode there, just to kind of get a feel for how it would do in an evening setting. Okay, benchmarking time. So Geekbench kind of points that the CPU is pretty powerful. Uh, it, however, is a bit misleading in that graphically, this particular chipset doesn't perform very well in Android. I think it's powerful enough, I just don't think it's well optimized for the workloads that it has to do. Uh, as you can see with the uh, N22 uh, graphics performance here and the PC Mark performance. On a personal level with the phone, I'm not really sure how I feel about these kind of jelly bean style emoji. I'm not in love with them, but I don't outright hate them either. I just, they just look odd to me. Um, 
the physical feel of the phone itself, uh, in terms of its backing and the buttons and the actual screen, it, it feels very similar to a cheap uh, Nokia that I bought a few years ago um, for just a, as a temporary phone. It was a Windows phone that I paid 50 bucks for. Um, this phone launched to the market at $150. It's retailing on Amazon right now for about 90. Uh, it has a very cheap plastic feel that is similar. Um, so it's, I'm not saying it is a cheap phone, it just doesn't feel the best quality, especially as somebody who's used to the glass and aluminum feels of the iPhones. This next part's a little bit of a criticism for the Android ecosystem because that means that Google, who is the software developer, doesn't have a very tight knit relationship for a lot of these devices. Uh, this leads me to to see a lack of performance optimization. Um, yes, it also leaves the door open for vulnerabilities to be exploited as well. You know, if Google finds a vulnerability and they got to push it out to the phones, then the manufacturer has to actually allow that change to be implemented, which I have received no updates at all for this phone. It's just on 5.0. It's not on 5.01 or 5.10. It's just 5.0. So I, I hope it's got all the security updates it needs. I, I don't know. The cellular signal indicator isn't terribly accurate. Uh, oftentimes it'll show I have about 75% signal, but I wouldn't be able to place calls or texts from my work office which is not unexpected. Uh, I, I basically live in a brick and concrete and rebar room with no windows, so it's not uncommon for there not to be cell service. However, I don't like that the phone tells me that there's good cell service, but then I don't get it. So that's, that's a, I guess that's a, a bug on the part of the software developer. I don't know if Google needs to be blamed for that, or I don't know if Blue needs to be blamed for that, but again, we have this break in the, the hardware to software uh, factor that I, I, I have a, I struggle with as, as an end user. I don't really care to deal with that kind of stuff. I, I just want it to work. I do, however, like the uh, ability to change the default apps that open. So, you know, one thing that iOS is infamous for is that you cannot set anything besides, say, Safari to open web pages. On Android, you can use this one came with Opera pre-installed, I installed Chrome, and I installed Firefox as well, and you can set any one of those to open. Um, it comes with the uh, gallery application that Android has, and the Google Photos application, and you can set Photos, Google Photos, which is my preference, to be the default photo app to open, which is also very cool, and I like that a lot. One thing performance-wise is the phone seems to struggle a whole lot on 3D games. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. I use it a lot, I use it every day, and the performance isn't horrendous, but it is definitely not ideal. There's oftentimes a lot of delays in the, when you tap a command and something actually happens on screen. Uh, there's a lot of long loading times between phrases, or between moments. So if you go from a menu screen into an actual battle mode, it can take many seconds, uh, probably upwards of 15, 20 seconds sometimes for that just to load properly. Um, this happens on Wi-Fi and cellular, which is a result of, uh, I, I assume, just lack of the ability for this hardware to push the graphics. That being said, 2D performance is pretty great. I played a uh, record of the Agarest War, or Legend of the Agarest War, uh, which is kind of a 2.5D game. That's It's got a bunch of two-dimensional sprites and some three-dimensional environments, and you can move around those environments a little bit inside the battle phases, and that is absolutely flawless. It's perfectly smooth, no issues at all with that. So not really for any modern 3D games, if you're gonna, interested in this kind of thing, as something to get a kid or somebody who... If you just need a workhorse phone and you want to do a little light gaming, that stuff's probably going to work just fine for you, but I would shy away from the 3D kind of stuff. As far as battery life goes, um, battery would have a tendency to last me through a day. I never really had a point where I was like, okay, uh, I'm getting below a certain percentage. I think the lowest I ever got on any of my days of using this was at 19% at the end of the day. And again, using Galaxy of Heroes every day, 
I was using a lot of CPU and GPU power, so that of course is going to drain the battery quickly. Uh, and so it's, it's a 3,000 milliamp hour battery. Seems to be great. Uh, it does what it says it's going to do. It'll last you through a day. In terms of, I don't know if it's the greatest quality battery in the world. Um, it does have to power a bigger screen than that of my iPhone 5S, but it doesn't seem to give it any real extra longevity. You know, at the end of the day, my iPhone 5S is generally sitting around the 20%, 25% mark, which is fairly common for this phone as well. Um, the lowest it was ever at was 19%. The highest it was ever at was 37%. So at the end of the day, when I plugged up, when I went to bed at about 10, 30, 11 o'clock Eastern. So the Blue Studio C is not a phone that is a bad phone. It's just not one of the high-end premium quality phones that you're going to find out there for four or five or six or $800. So it, for $100, it's not a bad deal. It's going to get, I think, most people to 80% of what they need to get done. So not really any high-end gaming, not any super great multimedia access. But it's going to work for most of the time, especially if you have to do just emails and documents, if you want to listen to music. The back speaker on it is really loud. It's not a studio quality speaker, so you're, you know, not really going to be, I don't think you're going to be editing any audio on this kind of type of phone, but it's going to be getting the job done for you. Uh, for phone calls, it's perfectly fine. Video conferencing, it's, it seems to be pretty good as well. I've had some issues doing... Um, some things in Snapchat doing the front-facing camera, it gets really choppy doing that. I don't know what's up with the front-facing camera doing video recording. If you just turn the front-facing camera on but aren't recording anything, it seems to be fine, but it's only during the recording times that we have these issues. So the cellular connection speeds are pretty good. Uh, you're going to get four to five megabytes per second during off-peak hours. During peak hours, one to two megabytes a second will come through, which seems to be more than enough for 720p uh, video through YouTube without any kind of significant interruptions or frame drops. Uh, cellular phone calls are fine as well, so when there is a good signal or even a moderate signal, it doesn't even have to be a very good signal, the phone will perform very well in this regard. So that's it. That's my review of the Blue Studio C. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions or concerns, if you have any comments or criticisms for me, please leave a comment uh, for me below. I am new at this, so I'm sure that I have not thought of every use case scenario that most folks will have for their phones, although I like to think I've covered the largest part of the gamut, if you will. So I look forward to hearing from you soon and having a little conversation with you. Thanks.